Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm your host, Lee Vinsel, an associate professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. You can reach me with comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or on Twitter at STS underscore news. I would love to hear from you. It's a mantra of the field of science and technology studies that technologies and infrastructures are expressions of values. And typically, the things humans build reflect some people's interests more than others. As Langdon Winter put it, artifacts have politics. Over the years, scholars and writers have put forward many different ways to think about how technologies embody values. Not all of these approaches are clear or analytically precise enough for my taste, but examples of how technologies are constructed to benefit some people and penalize others are plain to see. For instance, we can think of post-World War II highway construction in the United States and how often city leaders used highways to further racist aims of raising black neighborhoods. We can think about how poor people and racial and ethnic minorities generally have worse infrastructures. We can think about how building more roads and vehicles feeds into the interests of civil engineers, developers, auto companies, petroleum corporations, and drivers, but contributes to global climate change. We can think about how, for a long time in the USA, the only crash test dummy used was built to represent the average American guy. Some argue this is why women experience more injury and death in auto accidents. We can think about how many consumer products are designed in ways that exclude women, minorities, the disabled, trans people, the list goes on. But what does this social and technical reality mean for engineering students, individuals training to be professionals who design, build, run, and maintain technological systems in the world? What should professors be teaching students about their moral and political roles in society? Our guest in this episode, Donna Riley, professor and head of the School of Engineering Education at Purdue University, has been probing these questions for decades. In this interview, we talk about her path into engineering education and political activism and her 2008 book, Engineering and Social Justice. We also discuss how universities have changed since the book came out and her hopes for social justice in engineering education going forward. One quick note, we strive for audio quality here on Peoples and Things, but sometimes things go sideways. In this episode, my audio recorded a bit hot for some reason, and you'll also occasionally hear me echo in Donna's track. We've tried to clean things up as best we can, but sadly, there are limits to what's possible. Still, I think the interview holds up, and I really enjoyed my conversation with Donna. I hope you enjoy it too. Get excited! Donna, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Uh, Normally, I ask people what they are currently working on at the end of the interview, but I I feel like it might give listeners a sense you're be good to give them a kind of sense of your overall project to hear, you know, some of the things you're working on right now, which I know is always multiple. So why don't you just give us a taste of things you're up to these days? Sure. So... Yeah, so I've got a bunch of different projects in the works. So one of a project that I'm wrapping up right now um, with postdoc Ellen Foster um, is a project that's examining kind of how social organizing tools like relational organizing can be deployed to create change in engineering education settings. Um, I just finished a chapter for an anthology that's going to come out on 
Queer Experiences in Engineering Education, and that's edited by Kelly Cross and Stephanie Farrell. Uh, and I am forgetting the third editor. I might have to revisit that. I'm well. That's yeah, okay. I it happens. I'm not going to come us. up with it. Um, <laughs> And uh, then I'm also involved in an engineering research center called Aspire, which is about roadway electrification um, huh. infrastructure, basically, to, to address the climate crisis. Um, and I'm the engineering workforce director of that center. So um, it was sort of a way for me to go back to my roots in engineering and public policy and to really find a way as an academic to engage in research about the climate crisis, um, which I've been um, kind of urgently aware of and teaching about uh, for 20 years. Um, but it was it's it's a it's a nice feeling to be able to be part of something that feels um, like it, it could actually be a, a structural piece of of addressing climate change. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think and I think those the three projects you just uh talked about kind of give you give a nice picture of the sweep of things you're involved in from kind of social justice and students uh, experiences to, to actual engineering solutions. How did you how did you get into engineering as a as a young person? So I grew up in uh, Southern California, and one of the things that struck me as a young person was the um, the air quality in Los Angeles, which prevented me from going out to play at recess. We had smog alerts that kept us indoors. <laughs> we didn't have snow days, but we had smog alerts. Um, and the contrast between that reality and then traveling around California on family vacations and seeing how beautiful some of the natural areas in the state were, I, I just became interested in environmental problems. Um, the Superfund was um, passed into law when I was about 10. And so I saw through the 80s just in the newspaper as a student in high school, I became aware of hazardous waste issues in different communities. Um, and, and so I just I became interested in working on environmental problems. My father was an engineer, and so he steered me toward engineering. Um, he was the first in his family to get a college degree, and engineering was his um, route to doing that. And so um, I think that he really came to value both education and engineering as a field and um, steered me towards chemical engineering as a way to work on environmental problems, which probably wasn't the right <laughs> the right uh, field, yeah. um, given that most of the environmental work was happening in yeah. civil at that time. And yeah. environmental studies was something I thought about, but it wasn't yet a major on most campuses. And so I ended up getting a certificate in environmental studies, but a degree in chemical engineering. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always found it interesting that um, your your awareness of environmental issues is very much wrapped up in in how you became involved in in engineering. How about, I mean, were you involved in kind of around politics of gender, race, and sexuality from a very young age too? Was that part of your kind of early identity, or did that come mm -hmm. later? No, it came later. And the and the main thing that happened for me was I, in Southern California, I attended a girls school um, and it was I grew up in Pasadena. So I was in the shadow of Caltech and a lot of my math and science teachers actually had um, affiliation through marriage with Caltech. So they were Caltech wives, essentially Caltech professors, wives that taught me in the sciences yeah. and mathematics. And so I um, I was, I learned about sexism in history class. We had a very feminist history teacher when we learned about U.S. history. And I really was kind of naive enough to uh, not realize that people didn't think women could be engineers. And it wasn't until I went to Princeton for undergrad that I kind of slammed into this wall of sexism, both about Princeton itself as an institution, which... At that time, it had only been co-ed for 20 years, uh, which is not that long in the history of an institution that old. Um, and and in engineering in particular, I was I was shocked that not only um, were my professors kind of holding women at arm's length, but also um, my peers had sexist attitudes about who could and couldn't be an engineer. It was, it was surprising to me 
And worse than that, it, there was a lot of, you know, um, both microaggressions and things I might characterize as more sort of o overtly hostile things that happened to me in college. Um, and one of the one of the notable things that happened when I was a first year student was the Montreal massacre. And for folks who don't uh, aren't familiar with that, that was a shooting that happened at the university at the uh, Polytechnic in Montreal. Um, and 14 women were uh, murdered by a killer who was railing against feminists and had actually created mm. a hit list of 14 prominent Canadian feminists to go after that day. And what was so um, kind of radicalizing for me about that event was that engineering was silent on it. There was, there was very little recognition that that event had even occurred within engineering mm. on campus. And it really was the Campus Women's Center that ended up sponsoring a response to it, to which one engineering faculty member showed up. Um, and other than that, there was there was silence. Um, and that was what really um, kind of brought me into feminist activism on campus. And on a campus like Princeton in the late 80s, um, the way to be a feminist activist had to be um, in solidarity with other movements. And so I became very rapidly um, aware, I think, of kind of um, race politics, um, class issues on campus, anti-war politics. And so it was an important um, piece of my education there to sort of um, know what I didn't know and, and to try to um, kind of come up to speed on <laughs> on kind of other kinds of what we might call intersectional activism now, um, but how to be in solidarity with other movements and really plan, um, you know, the Women's Center uh, had to in, had to be, um, you know, raising issues around race and sexuality and environment and um, you name it, right, in mm -hmm. order to plan its activities on a, on a small campus with a small number of progressives. Yeah. So, I mean, one, maybe one trajectory or one place where you end up because of these experiences is that, that this 2008 book you published, uh, Engineering and Social Justice. So how would you, how would you explain what you were trying to do in that book to a stranger? And, you know, what was the context? What was going on around you when you wrote that book that you were trying yeah. to respond to? So. Yeah. So the so the context is that, you know, what ensued from the from the point I just described was a lot of campus activism. And then when I went to grad school, also um, just community activism. At that time, I was in the city of Pittsburgh um, and I got very involved in queer politics um, after I came out in 1991. And um, I was involved in the Lesbian Avengers. I was um, involved in other kinds of direct action movements. And I wanted to put that together with engineering uh, in a lot of ways. I was interested in environmental justice. I tried to kind of work that into my engineering and public policy work, which ended up being in risk assessment and risk communication. And one of the things that was really clear uh, or became clear to me during grad school was kind of this two cultures problem where um, part of my research group was in the social sciences and part was in engineering. And there was a clear line mm -hmm. about what problems were was studying. Um, I became involved in a needle exchange that was a, a local um, thing that was happening mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and uh, I thought, well, this would be an interesting problem to look at technology and policy. And basically that wasn't going to fly. <laughs> Yeah. In part because I was an activist. And so I think I think that, you know, my advisors felt I couldn't possibly be objective, but also I think it just wasn't seen as an engineering problem. Right. right? It's not so, an engineering problem. Right. So so with those kinds of disciplinary boundaries, right, I was sort of like, well, how how do you kind of get um, social justice into engineering? How do you combine the two? And and I couldn't really find a way to do that. Um, and ultimately, what I ended up finding, so long story short, I end up at Smith College, which um, was at that time founding a engineering program at um, the first US Women's College to to have an in house engineering program. Hmm. And so I was I was doing that work. And one of the things that we were very curious about was um, 
you know, how to do engineering education, both centered around sustainability. Our founding director was really interested in that, but also thinking about how to do this in a liberal arts environment and in a women's college. And so um, it was for me, I think, an opportunity to really think about how to how to bring together, um, you know, my activism, my to the extent that I had background in the social sciences and my engineering world. Um, and I became really curious about pedagogy in part because of my very traditional experiences with pedagogy in engineering and undergrad and contrasting that with, um, you know, more liberative approaches that I experienced in the social sciences. And so I became curious about that because I was at a liberal arts college. Um, I was able to sort of get help from colleagues. Um, I had a colleague who was actually at a different liberal arts college suggest that I read Bell Hooks book, Teaching to Transgress, which I did. And it so happened that Bell Hooks came to speak at Smith that same hmm. semester. And so I was able to have a conversation with her, a small college environment like that. Um, and she was very encouraging and said, whatever you do, write about what you do. So, huh. so I wrote about these kinds of um, experiments, for lack of a better word, that I was trying to do in my, in my thermodynamics classroom, trying to uh, work on, on leveling power dynamics, trying to, trying to change, you know, who had authority, who was able to speak, who participated and how, and that um, really, for me, ended up being the way that I could bring um, social justice ideas into a classroom where the disciplinary boundaries were so tight. Um, yeah. And through that work, I ended up meeting some kindred spirits um, at through the engineering education conferences that I'd begun to attend. I met a guy named George Catalano who um, had just a very idealistic approach to teaching peace to engineers. And he had actually, huh. um, he was one of the first civilians employed at West Point, And he went there intentionally to teach peace to West Point cadets. Um, and so hmm. he had uh, this really deep and thoughtful um, approach to thinking about peace issues in engineering, um, and also really broadly and holistically thinking about sustainability um, and animal rights in engineering settings. And he had teamed up with Caroline Bailey, who had recently uh, moved from the UK to Canada. She was at Queen's University, um, and she had hosted a conference on social justice in 2004, engineering and social justice in 2004, huh. where she'd gathered a group of transdisciplinary folks uh, to Queen's, and George had attended. And so that was where the engineering, social justice, and peace group um, was formed. And it was, um, you know, Caroline had had uh, originally called it engineering and social justice, and George was the one that kind of brought the peace part <laughs> yeah. to it. And then, yeah. and then I met George first. George introduced me to Caroline, and then George hosted the second meeting in Binghamton, New York. Um, he was at SUNY Binghamton, and we um, had a meeting in 2006 that really did change. Uh, for me, kind of that direction of my career where, where Caroline had a book series uh, contract from Morgan and Claypool and was looking for folks to write on engineering and social justice. And um, my book originally was supposed to have been really about pedagogies of liberation. And it was Joel Claypool, who basically knowing Google and the way people were starting to use search engines, he said, you have to just call this engineering and social justice because that's how people are going to find it. Um, right. And so that's, that's what happened with that book. Um, and 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 I wrote it as a primer, really thinking about my students and sort of what I wish I had known um, as an undergraduate who huh. had sort of come into engineering um, out of maybe not a social justice commitment, because I think that developed over time for me, but um, but kind of who had struggled to put those two things together for a long time to try to um, try to help engineers um, think about how these how these things might go together. Mm -hmm. um, I, what is the field of engineering education for listeners who haven't heard of it? Like, you know, I only became aware of it you know, as a separate thing. I feel like only like five or six years ago. So, so what is it, uh, and you know, can, what is his background? Yeah. So the background goes back. Um, 
as, as I understand it, you know, at least 125 years um, back to the founding of a professional society called the American Society for Engineering Education. And it really goes back to kind of, I think its roots can be traced to kind of the evolution of mass production in the United States and the, the emergence of engineering as a professionalized career that as it transitioned from being a more apprentice model, um, it, it became sort of necessary as land grant colleges were being founded to basically create large numbers of engineers to work in industry. Uh, people began to think um, conscientiously about engineering education and it's, it's always been um, kind of a mix of ideas um, borrowing in part from you know, progressive educators like John Dewey and in part from, you know, like Taylorism <laughs> yeah. and industrial methods. Um, and so over time, um, it, it was for a time the arbiter of, of engineering accreditation to ensure that engineering education was happening in a standardized way and covering certain um, topics and skill sets that industry in theory uh, would need and want. Um, and it over time has developed into a more research e-discipline. Um, there was an idea uh, coming out of the National Science Foundation once it started. Um, so it's a long history there where um, in the 80s, Reagan had pulled the funding for, educate, for the education directorate at the National Science Foundation. And the engineering director, which was then still quite young, um, its director, Nam Su, decided that it was necessary to fund uh, education projects within engineering. And so there, there, there came to be this kind of specific um, interest that looked like a research project in um, engineering education and in um, kind of trying to make education reform happen by doing research. So there was a implicit theory of change in all this that engineering deans and so forth would be convinced by data. And so by conducting research, um, it might be possible to convince them to do the things that really the field had been calling for uh, maybe since, you know, about 1918 and the Mann Report, where it was noted that engineers needed to be liberally educated in order to um, you know, serve uh, the I think the goals of a profession, right? To try mm -hmm. to make engineering a, a profession, it ought to have the ethical autonomy um, that other aspirational professions for engineers like medicine and law had uh, at that time. Um, so there was just an idea that, that there ought to be an assurance that engineers were not merely trained technically, but that they had a uh, quality liberal education. Mm -hmm. um, however, that has for the last hundred years not been realized for um, a lot of different reasons. Yeah. And that's something that the field is, is interested in studying, but also very limited in its ability to analyze and critique in such a way that actually produces change. Yeah. I think, you know, we can talk about the longer history of um, engineers who've called for uh, engineering to focus on peace and poverty and, and justice issues that, you know, Matt Wisnowski writes about this in his book, Engineers for Change. But I think within the field of engineering education, I feel like you and, and the colleagues you described earlier are a part, like a part of this moment for calling for change within that field. Um, so what was, you know, what did, what did you all feel like the field of engineering education was like before, you know, or as you're calling for these kinds of changes? Um, I mean, so for the engineering social justice and peace group in particular, I think that a central critique for us was around neoliberalism in particular. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of other stuff going on and each person will tell a different story yeah. <laughs> around yeah. what they, you know, what they were most passionate about. And I think if you go back and you sort of see different, different projects emerging at different times, I think that, uh, you know, the U.S. involvement in various wars <laughs> in the Middle East was, mm -hmm. was also a central push for, for some of the folks. Um, but I think that, 
There was also this kind of emergence of engineering to help projects um, with kind of the, the founding of Engineers Without Borders USA um, around uh, in the early 2000s, I think was when that happened. And so there was kind of a, a response from more socially justice minded folks about uh, a concerning um, power imbalance, uh, patronizing attitude, um, lack of accountability to communities. All of those mm -hmm. things were, I think, central to to what we were um, concerned about and just really trying to bring a more critical analysis um, to the work of engineering and to really begin to expose the ways that engineering and the, its practice is unjust because um, that's really where it it has to start is kind of um, pointing out the structural inequities that are inherent in in engineering. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that, the, you know, the primary focus of that group was um, in kind of global economic systems to, okay. to begin with, not that, um, you know, not that other kinds of things like racism or sexism or heterosexism weren't on the table. Um, but I think that one of the things that really distinguished us from other groups in engineering at that time was the willingness to look critically at economic systems. Yeah. So, I mean, neoliberalism is one of these terms that means a lot of different things in different communities. But it sounds to me like you're talking about the kind of global spread of kind of free market, market driven ideas and how engineering then play, plays a role in that because it's so caught up with global production systems. Am I hearing you right? Yes, I, I think that's right. And I think that the, you know, the way that engineering instantiates that is also so bound up in war activities, those yeah. kinds of things yeah. that it all, you know, and racism, right? So it all colonialism, right? It all kind of gets put together um, within engineering in a, in, in a, particularly maybe stark way or, or clear mm -hmm. way. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, engineers uh, going all the way back to the 19th century, late 19th century have been, you know, servants of capital, right? So as traditionally, you know, and so what what capitalism's up to and what corporations are up to, engineers are playing a central part in that game. So I, I totally agree with your... Um, your analysis there. Uh, you So we were talking about your professional society, the American Society of Engineering Education, uh, before we press, started pressing record. But I gather that there's like a subsection or part of uh, ASEE that you hang out in, in with these folks. So what is the name of what is the name of it? And what's it all about? So the division that I've been part of um, most actively is the Liberal Education Slash Engineering and Society Division, otherwise known as LEES. And for a long okay. time, it was called the Liberal Education Division. Um, and Gary Downey, who you know, um, instituted this name change <laughs> to highlight some of the engineering and society work that was emerging uh, when when he chaired that division. Um, it's, it's an interesting um, piece because it used to be the Liberal Ed Division was founded fairly early in the history of the society. And it was the catch-all space for anything that wasn't a clearly named um, discipline of engineering. So the early divisions in ASWE were the civil engineering division, the chemical engineering division, the mechanical engineering division. And then liberal education sat there as all the other pieces of the yeah. engineering curriculum that people <laughs> yeah. would what deal with. What doesn't fit. But, yeah. as result, <laughs> right. but as a result, who showed up to that um, were educators of engineers who come from all different disciplines. So it's long yeah. had uh, philosophers and, um, you know, English, English instructors of various types, whether they're in kind of a communication mode or teaching literature. Um, there were, you know, foreign language instructors, all kinds of folks from different, um, from different parts of uh, College of Liberal Arts or Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, were present with engineers as well, trying to think through, um, you know, how to accomplish this educational breadth for engineers. Over time, as as ABET 2000 came on board, which is a whole other little thing that we'd have to define, but basically yeah. the accreditation board, yeah. 
changed how it did accreditation um, in the late 90s. And it created uh, a push within the society, within the professional society, to focus more on things like engineering ethics and huh, to really get right. serious about learning how to teach that to engineers. And so there was an ethics division that split off from the liberal ed division because it had um, grown so big to have its own program. And so, you know, one of the newest um, emergent divisions right now is actually focused on issues of social justice. And so that's mm -hmm. its own kind of interesting thing. Um, but over time, there's been a lot more. There's now, you know, a dozen divisions that have um, some piece of of a um, either social justice agenda or kind of broadening um, broadening education of engineers within the society. But Lee's has been, I think, um, you know, for me, it was the home at the time that I came into the society. And it's been a place um, that was much more flexible in terms of the types of sessions, because one of the things that always felt very regimented about the conferences at ASWE was that we would have these, um, they'd put six papers in a 90 minute session and everybody <laughs> right. would kind of race through a talk and there'd be no time for discussion after. And yeah. the the liberal education division said, you know what, we're not going to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. People can read the paper. We're going to give a quick summary of the talk and we're going to spend the rest of the time um, really having a deeper discussion and analysis of, of the topics folks are bringing up. And so that's led to, I think, a, a creative space and a, a space where folks can bring some of the more critical ideas into the society. That's great. Uh, speaking of creative, you have a, a wonderful section in engineering and social justice uh, where you're describing engineering mindsets and you do so by talking about jokes about engineers and what they tell us about engineering culture. So I just thought, I thought I'd read a couple jokes here. I, I got a sure. three short ones. <laughs> uh, the first one is real engineers have politics that run towards a corner office and a parking space with a name on it. I thought that was wonderful. Uh, real engineers have a non-technical vocabulary of 800 words. Uh, and then my personal favorite, what's the difference between a mechanical engineer and a civil engineer? Mechanical engineers build weapons and civil engineers build targets. So what, what do you think these jokes uh, teach us about the way we think about engineers? And these are probably jokes that engineers tell about themselves, right? This is not, exactly. these are not jokes that, um, yes. you know, that are told about engineers. So what, what does it tell us about them? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it does a couple of different things, right? I think it simultaneously critiques and reinforces uh, a culture in engineering. Um, so there's a some recognition that engineers aren't supposed to, there's a norm, right, that's being expressed that engineers aren't supposed to uh, care about anything except their creature comfort goals of middle management or whatever you might call their their role in a in an engineering organization or, or a large corporation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that you have this, the mechanical versus civil thing I think points out some of the history of, you know, civil engineering um, is called civil engineering because it's civilian engineering. So that distinction between military projects and um, what you might call peaceful infrastructure projects, if you can make that distinction cleanly, yeah. <laughs> uh, the attempt is to um, basically, you know, tell this joke about um, these different disciplines. And it's actually um, more often told by mechanical engineers in a disparaging way towards civil engineers, yeah. although it can obviously be taken in an anti-militaristic way. Um, it's actually like, oh, those civil engineers are weak and their stuff isn't, you know, isn't that strong, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's actually got that kind of irony to it and not, and not the way that a uh, social justice minded person might take it. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the ways that you, you want to reform engineering education to bring issues of justice, you know, to students. So I think that, you know, this is, this has been a, a long conversation over many years and I, and I think about it a lot and I think a lot about higher education and how higher education has changed in the last 20 years and what its 
um, promises and limitations are <laughs> yeah. for radicalizing anybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and so I'm I'm increasingly yeah. concerned about education having been redefined in the United States context, at, at least as being extremely instrumentalist, that education has become more and more a credentialing exercise yep. for uh, nothing more than um, your job access, yeah. right? And and it isn't anymore about uh, some of the more um, noble ideas about um, being an, an actor in communities and in the world that could create positive change. Yeah. Um, so, so I like to think that liberal education still exists in institutions of higher education where um, not not putting it on the social sciences and humanities to deliver that, but suggesting instead that a free curriculum that allows students to take uh, different courses from different perspectives that have personal interest to the student can produce a type of critical thinking and intellectual power and reflective action in the world that's, that's fundamentally transformational. Um, I still believe that that's possible, although... <laughs> Yeah. Although I'm also very aware of um, just just how much harder that vision has gotten to achieve in in just really even the last 20 years. Um, yeah. Even since your book was published in 2008, I feel like there's been a real narrowing. I mean, at some point I will be writing and, and talking kind of publicly about something my department uh my department of science technology and society tried to create an undergraduate major um and we were shot down by a state level organization here in virginia because we were not you know for their taste like focused on job creation you know job like creating jobs enough and it's just like totally bonkers you know i mean i teach people how industries work and technologies work and how different cultures create and adopt technologies I mean, this is totally applicable in business and engineering and everything else. But when you have such a circumscribed idea of what preparing someone for a job is, so there's literally like a credential and then it's going to plug into a an occupation somewhere. It's just, you know, it totally changes the nature of what what colleges are. So I, I hear you. I'm, I mean, I, I share both the ideals and the, the worries that that you're articulating. Yeah, and and when I think about something like the climate crisis um, or pandemics, which we're in, uh, you know, you name it, the the complexity of the problems, and you know, maybe these kinds of complexities have always been with us, but I feel like it is absolutely even more urgent and more imperative now than ever that um, that that anybody who's technically educated is also able to to think in a very large scale way to think in systems, to think structurally about inequality, to, to be able to place um, and think through values conflicts and to be able to, um, to use moral imagination in, in thinking about technology. And I'm so concerned that, that we're um, abandoning all of that at, yeah. at just the wrong yeah. moment. I wondered where, um, you know, like conservative and libertarian leaning students fit in in your picture? Because, I mean, you point out in the book very, you know, with data and stuff that, you know, engineering, uh, engineers and engineering students are very often conservatives and libertarians. And that's certainly my experience, too. At my last workplace, Stevens Institute of Technology, you know, it was a very conservative place. Um, you know, I would say that not only were there a lot of Republicans, you know, like a lot of Republican students, but even the the Democrat leaning students tended to be kind of conservative um, for for the left. So I just wonder how how they kind of fit in the way you think about this, given that, you know, most of the theories you're drawing on come not exclusively, but most of them kind of come from left leaning perspectives. So, yeah, just how do you think about conservative students in in your classes? Right. So, you know, for me, it's always about teaching the ideas um, and the the students are going to. So 
if anything, I'm providing balance in a curriculum that is very much weighted towards conservative thinking, right? So when you mm -hmm. look at engineering as a whole, uh, someone who has conservative values and libertarian values, um, I, and I think each distinctively are reinforced in different ways uh, yeah. in different parts of engineering, right? Libertarian culture is so much a part of Silicon Valley um, mm. that students that are aspiring to careers there and are taking coding classes and all those kinds of things, those libertarian assumptions show up everywhere in what they're doing. It's yeah. not explicitly called out. So those politics are uh, the invisible norm, right? And there's a, a depoliticization that Aaron Sack and others have pointed out that really, uh, you know, makes those things uh, seem like uh, just the way things are yeah. when in fact those are uh, political perspectives that are already being taken in the profession. So in some ways yeah. I see the courses that I teach as providing a, a place of balance um, for that. Um, but it's also, you know, when I think about most, you know, traditionally aged undergrads are at an important point in their own uh, moral development. And it's a space to really, uh, you know, look at and examine uh, different perspectives. So yeah. if we can do that together, then it, it provides another way of looking at the world that they may not have seen or entertained before. And, yeah. and for students yeah. who do uh, come to engineering, as I did, with some kind of, uh, you know, at least a mild interest in, <laughs> in, in doing something just for people or the planet, that, that there be somebody there to receive those students and be there uh, for them and to help them think about how to navigate engineering. And, and a lot of that, you know, I gained from my classes outside of engineering um, in some very odd, you know, <laughs> and I've written about this elsewhere where, you know, I took a class on religions of late antiquity and I wrote a paper on Melania the Younger, who was this early Christian ascetic who was, yeah. you know, yeah. um, hiding her gender in order to have a leadership role in you know, yeah. the early church. And it was like, I learned more about engineering culture <laughs> by writing that paper than I learned in my uh, technical courses. And I thought, well, if we could just for a second, talk about what we're doing. Like we go meta for a second in my engineering yeah. course and really uh, just go one level up. Uh, it would have really benefited me. And so I try mm -hmm. to bring that in so that students are able to kind of do that. Um, you know, there's a, a conversation between Paulo Freire and Ira Shore that took place in the 80s that I think is really <laughs> instructive on this point as well, where I think it was Ira Shore was asking Freire, like, what do you do uh, when you have basically yuppie students, right? The phenomenon that he was dealing with was students coming in with these, you know, kind of like they aspire to the MBA, you know, what is my obligation to the student? And Paulo Freire had a really uh, interesting take, which was that, well, absolutely, you meet the student where they are and you're planting the seeds of the critique of that thing, right? That, that yeah. eventually the student may <laughs> come to right. see the world differently. And the hope is that by providing that critical conversation, you are in fact, um, you know, offering them that opportunity for, for transformation. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yeah, so that's a, that's basically what I, what I aim to do. And I think, you know, I think I, of course in my head is like, you know, the conversations that are happening now around critical race theory and around, you know, what's being labeled indoctrination, you know, and I think about how, you know, how far that is from reality in terms of, you know, how, yeah. how pedagogy works, at least in my classrooms, you know, I am not, you know, telling anybody what to believe I'm presenting readings for consideration and critique. And it's that practice of critique that's so important, right? Because uh, including of my own, of my own work, right? So, you know, I try mm -hmm. to be the first. <laughs> to examine and critique um, as best I can. And I rely so much on others who have read more widely and think more critically than I do in my own work. And so I try to model that and to show that to students. And it's that kind of, I think, um, epistemic humility that is really important for students to yes. see and learn. And and it's that that concept of of making a reflective judgment about knowledge or, you know, I think college students go through a time when they believed what their teacher or parents told them. They move into a more nebulous space. This is sort of the King and Kitchener theory about developing reflective judgment. 
And then they go into this kind of liminal space of, well, anything goes and everything's yeah. relative and anybody can say right. anything they want to say. And then they eventually come out with the ability to evaluate arguments. Right. And yeah. I think that's just that's a basic function of of college education in any discipline that students ought to be learning how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And and there's no better way to do that than to examine a variety of perspectives. So, so that's that is what I what I try to do in my classes. Yeah, that's that's great. I I also think I mean I I'll direct listeners to um, engineering and social justice, which is up online. Um, I also think there's a really wonderful uh, uh, section on kind of justice and religion and different religious traditions you tap into, and I find like bringing that into discussion, including with conservative students, often kind of enlivens things and allows us to see. Uh, kind of possibilities of conversation that we might not otherwise, you know, I find that, for instance, um, you know, uh, evangelical students care about creation because they, they see it as like part of their duty uh, sometimes to, to care for it. And, you know, I have, you know, here in Western Virginia, uh, you worked at Virginia Tech for a while, so you know the students here. You know, a lot of them are hunters and outdoors people who, you know, care about conservation and stuff. So, you know, if you can talk about like, you know, where where their cares about the world kind of tap into these issues um, and let them allow give them a space to be open about where they're coming from. I think it, it kind of opens up conversations around these things in ways that are not critical race theory indoctrination, as talked about by uh, conservative <laughs> politicians these days. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And when and when students bring are able to bring their whole selves into the classroom and articulate their values and the many places that they come from, because, of course, a lot of values aren't formed in schooling. Yeah. And I think yeah. I think that is the place to start um, with students because they're able to then, uh, you know, carve out their own path and make their education meaningful to them. And that that is the that is the purpose of education. And so I think it's uh, you know, <laughs> just so missing the mark to be arguing about, you know, an imaginary curriculum uh, yeah. where I think, I think they really are, you know, the banking model <laughs> that Prairie critiqued is exactly what's in the minds of people that are calling this indoctrination, right? They really think yeah. someone is taking a picture of knowledge and pouring it in someone's head. And that's not, uh, that's not the deal in my class anyway. So, <laughs> I don't think it works that way, uh, personally, even and if you try, they will rebel. So I just don't think that I don't think that's how it works. Uh, you also have um, important reflections on how a, a focus on justice and goodness in engineering can go sideways. And I think this is a good place to bring in the piece you wrote with Amy Slayton, who's um, a historian of technology and uh, work and, and also works in engineering education. And the piece you wrote is called Troubling Virtue engineering and poverty in the, the age of the down and out. And the piece examines uh, the cover of uh, the December 2017 issue of PRISM, which is the magazine of your professional society, the American Society of Engineering Education. And the cover featured a homeless person seen from the neck down with dirty hands uh, seated directly on the pavement before a tin can, which holds a crumpled dollar bill and a small American flag. And the cover contained the headline "Design for the Down and Out." So, what did you and what did you and Slayton see as wrong or troubling in this kind of cover image of, oh. you know, engineering and poverty? <laughs> so, so many things, and I think that one of the backstories that's important to that piece is that ASCE Prism has long had these kinds of. Um, problematic cover art, right? That yeah. that we've long talked about. Amy and I will text each other when we get our our new issue of Prism and say, "Can you believe it this month?" Right? And so this one was one <laughs> yeah. that that finally, like we we've all we've had as this kind of you know the project that you never that you never actually do, right? Is to is to pull all of the images and do do the full critique yeah. of them, and we we've never gotten around to that. But I hope someone does. But um, but in this particular instance, we were like, okay, we have to write something now. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we really were, you know, there's a whole lot of different points of entry here um, about kind of how homelessness is being um, characterized, you know, by the, by this engineering education society, right? Yeah. And there's a, 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 uh, 
you know, it's setting up, you know, the, you know, I guess the biggest narrative that I concern myself with is this idea of engineering to help and, you know, white saviorism and all the things that go into that and engineering's positioning itself as yeah. having these technological fixes that purportedly address homelessness when they ignore the root causes of homelessness and refuse to look at the structural. And in fact, uh, it's it's more than just a distraction, right? It's, you know, by framing it in this particular light, we are denying engineering's responsibility for um, for being present in the in the in the yeah. structural part of it, right? And yeah. and this is something I I think about a lot as someone who, um, you know, I was involved in uh, the early well in about the early 2010s in opposing a nuclear um, a nuclear energy facility in my community. And as an engineer, I felt like the most effective thing I could do was be in the street about it, right? And I, yeah. and I you know, was yeah. was arrested at a nuclear power facility. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and and that was much more effective than anything I could have done uh, as a risk analyst. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I think about that a lot. And so with homelessness, right, we talk in that piece about you know, engineers ought to be <laughs> thinking about housing first solutions and we ought to be getting out in, in the community and, um, you know, working on racism and working on, um, you know, how trans kids are being put out of their houses <laughs> yeah. in the first yeah. place, right? Those kinds of things, um, you know, working to end poverty, fighting for minimum wage, fighting for voting rights, all of those things are part of a more systemic solution than, some of the things that we described in the article, um, as, you know, things like, oh, there's an app for that. Yeah, literally. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, yeah, literally yeah. an app for that. So, yeah. um, so that that was the basic idea of the article was to yeah. was to kind of make that that visible. And what's interesting is that when we when we write pieces like that, there are a lot of folks in in the engineering education community who go, oh yeah, yeah, you know, who go, yes, 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 right? Who yeah. say, you know, thank you for saying that. Um, and that I find that that's um, just a, it's, it's affirming and I think it's really important because it, it yep. reflects back to us the, the shortcomings of engineering education that we have you know, this group of engineering educators who have similar sensibilities, but maybe not the ability to articulate that. Yeah. Um, and so once it's out there, I think we're starting to see a growing number of people making similar arguments, starting to uh, yep. think the same, yep. the same way, starting to read more widely. Um, and, and I, I'm, it does give me hope that, that we might reach a tipping point. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I um, totally agree with what you're saying. I, I like, um, you know, I, I I write these polemical pieces, like in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, sometimes, for instance. And um, you know, I recently wrote one about kind of uh, the spread of business bullshit and PR speak in higher education circles. And people write it like they'll tell they'll tell me like, well, you didn't write it in a way that you're gonna like win over the president of the university who's making these like demonstrably questionable claims. And I'm like, I'm not actually writing it for him. I don't know if you realize that's a possibility. I'm writing it for other people <laughs> in my position out there who like maybe feel alone or just feel like no one else is thinking these things. And I'm trying to put an argument as clearly as possible so that you know they feel solidarity with other folks around them. and. It provides a launching point for discussions they can have in their their own communities. So, yeah, I really I like the way you you put that. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and it's related to this piece you wrote with Amy. Um, and you've already kind of talked about it, but maybe maybe we could say more. Or maybe maybe we've tapped it out. But part of what it, this is is this balance between people's professional lives and the way we think about justice and that. So, I mean, like you know, we can think about like the way ethics classes have been taken up in engineering curricula. And, you know, I have big questions. I mean, I, I get the intent and why it's good, but I also have big questions about the efficacy of that. 
versus their lives as citizens. And, you know, engineers happen to be human beings who are citizens and hopefully have voting rights, too. So, like, and, you know, it's you know, and Amy, right. In reality, the most effective actions as engineers can take to end homelessness more likely lie in lending their time and talent to local citizen political action. So how do you think about that as an educator, this kind of difference between the students you're teaching as people who might someday be sitting in the corner office versus like, you know, that what happens in their lives, like when they walk out the door of the, the firm they work for? Right. And, you know, I think that in the engineering and social justice community in particular, there's a lot of students who are who are work, trying to work through various kinds of cognitive dissonance around that. Right. Whether they are uh, currently or aspire to that kind of job and they care about social justice or trying to work out for themselves what that looks like. And, and there's a lot of models out there of of people um you know who who are at in all different positions around that right there are people educated as engineers that never work for a large corporation and that um end up working for nonprofits and yep. what's very difficult i think about those career tracks is that they get thought of as not engineers whether they yep. think of themselves as engineers whether they maintain that engineering identity uh, it's very hard for an undergrad to see that as engineering work. And so that's something that that I try to make more visible for students. And then you have people who really do kind of lead a double life, right? They'll spend their, <laughs> yeah. their day job yeah. making money, uh, doing whatever it is they do. They compartmentalize that and then do their activism separately. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's a, that's a strategy. There are people who do that, I think, um, you know, the amount of kind of community support and um, and sort of grounding that you need to have in kind of a critical community is is an important thing to think about. So like, what, yeah. you know, how do you maintain yeah. your sense of self? How do you maintain your integrity? How do you how do you do that in a large organization um, when people take on these institutionalist projects? And that's been my, you know, my whole life has yeah. been I've been in in the academy. Right. It is not. I have worked in predominantly white institutions that are not socially just in their admissions practices, in their yeah. uh, recruitment and retention of faculty, right? All of these things are things that I critique and I'm aware, I try to keep as aware as I can of kind of where um, where opportunities for change lie and what the real what the real points of leverage are, what's going to create real change. I try to stay out of you know, things that sap your energy, rearrange yes. deck chairs, right? But it's, I think we all are impure in some way, right? Even yeah, yeah. when, you know, yeah. even if uh, I'm participating in a, in a social justice movement organization, right? I think the same issues come up about co-optation, about where so, your funding comes from, about, right? So all of that yeah. stuff is stuff that we have to think about as, as people, right? So, yeah. um, you know, how do you work for, the world that you want? How do you imagine the world as it could be otherwise and work toward that uh, mm -hmm. when you have, you know, student debt, right? There yeah. are very real, when you have someone you have to uh, support financially, right? There's lots of real constraints. And so um, I do take a lot of calls from students in, you know, the sort of social justice space in engineering. Um, and so helping, helping them think through, like, what are your real needs, right? What do you really need to uh, to meet those obligations to yourself, to your family, to pay off your, your loans, whatever it is you have to do. And then how do you construct your life in a way that, yeah. that works for you? I, I think those are very real conversations. And, and I think too often engineering doesn't even, doesn't even talk about it because there's just an assumption that you're going to the corner office, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so to really get, yeah. to get real yeah. about that, I do find a number of students it is necessary to kind of confront them with their own engineering privilege in that way of like, yeah. I, I get these uh, emails from time to time from people who are working in industry now who are like, how can I still make my same salary and work on social justice? <laughs> right? Expecting that there's some nonprofit yeah. out there that's going to hire them. Right. Um, but they still want to work as an engineer, whatever that means. Right. And so there's a lot of that kind of um, that work that has to be done to kind of, uh, help students see that and think about it and and reconstruct what how their life could be otherwise right that's a big lift it's a big transition 
but I've seen I've seen students make those transitions and and change you know how, where they put their energy and time and I think this is a really ripe moment for people who are rethinking their their world and thinking about how you know how yeah. do we build something different yeah I mean one thing I want to draw out with uh, what you just said that I think is really important is that um, when you're dealing with engineers, um, there is this conception of engineering identity and engineering work that is kind of like an extra layer of kind of fraught tension for these people. And so um, your colleague, Alice Polly and uh, Marie Peretti here at Virginia Tech and her student, uh, Chris, Christopher Gewertz, are some folks who have kind of gotten at this of like you know the the what is and is not considered engineering work often kind of limits possibilities that students see in the world for for what might be good for them to do and it's just like it's a fascinating kind of reality that that this identity kind of gets can get in the way you know and has to be thought through in, in that way very much so and and i think it is it is really important because we work so hard in like first year engineering programs to form engineering identity because it's important for retention, right? When we think yep. about diversity of yep. who who gets to be an engineer, you know, we yep. work really hard at, at helping people put together um, minoritized identities or marginalized identities with an engineering identity. Um, but I think we do need to do a lot more work around um, kind of really deeply helping students see what the career opportunities are and work outside of careerist opportunities are yeah. right for for engineers and that's something that we've done superficially right there's a whole report called changing the conversation that's about you know engineering um for good right it positions yeah. this kind of uh engineering to help uh rhetoric but it doesn't really substantively create the opportunities so when students graduate uh having been promised you know, a six figure salary start. And they're yeah. like, well, <laughs> not in the nonprofit world. The only people know. offering me that not are, you know, world, yeah, right. You know. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's uh, uh, helping students figure that out. I mean, I, I remember teaching a student when I was a grad student, there was a, I taught a seminar on ethics for research student under undergrad research students. And the student uh, had the epiphany as a senior that the scholarship he'd been receiving and the work he was going to do was defense related. He had not seen it. He didn't understand um, that the folks that were paying his bills and expecting him to work for them after graduation were was a big defense contractor. Yeah. Um, and that was a really tough thing for him. He's yeah. he was like, I wish someone had told me. Right. And so yeah. that that sticks in my head a lot about, you know, how do we help yeah. students just coming in? Um, you know, when we're, when we're promising the world about, you know, making the world better engineers improve, you know, yeah. such and so for humanity, right. To help them yeah. understand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, we could have a whole exactly another, what engineering uh, is and yeah, is yeah. not. I mean, we yeah. Have a whole yeah. Other... We could have a whole nother multi-hour conversation about the images yeah, of engineers we give students, you know, around innovation <laughs> and all this kind of stuff and you know they're going to be elon musk oh, yeah. when really uh, they're going to be doing operations mm -hmm. and maintenance in the guts of <laughs> some fairly large organization there's a high chance of that anyway you know so there's a real there's real questions about the yep, the right. kind of images of engineering that we circulate um i wanted i wanted to end just by asking you know do you think have you what improvements have you seen over the course of your career in engineering education and also you know what do you want to see more of? Like, what gives you, what do you hope for? Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, what I've seen is a, uh, a willingness to, um, to think about the politics of, of engineering culture, to, to see it, to talk about it, to name it, um, to use the words engineering and social justice together in a sentence. To use the word racism, this is something that um, that I noted when I first when I went to the National Science Foundation in 2013. I I had done a quick search of the literature in engineering education and found mm -hmm. very little naming of of racism. People would say sexism, they wouldn't say racism. Yeah. 
they would talk about broadening participation. They would use euphemistic yeah, terms, yeah, but yeah. they wouldn't call out racism. People are calling out structures of power. Now they're calling out uh, more than just race and gender. They're talking about class. They're talking about um, yeah. LGBTQ. They're talking about um, uh, folks with all different kinds of disabilities. Yeah. There's there's just a and not just in the technological fixed yeah. sense. So there's a there's just a lot of the conversation that's broadened. So I'm um, hopeful about that 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 all these things exist. That students are demanding a different type of education. That there's a general pushback now on um, kind of the well-being of students and mental health in higher ed. And engineering's getting, I think, to the point where we can't be doing the kinds of uh, I don't even know what to call it, like of the physical demands of engineering, of you must yeah. stay up all night to finish this problem set, yes. you, must, uh, you must hurt yourself to be an yes. engineer, I think is being taken off the table. So, so there's, those things I think are all really helpful. Um, at the same time, I, I think that, I, I don't have any illusions about the fact that all of the isms uh, have this way of reasserting themselves in a different form, right? So yeah. you can push back against uh, sexism, say, in one way, and um, people might change their language or uh, stop some of the really crass overt joking, but then you still have <laughs> sexism show up another way in the classroom. So, so I just I think that we haven't done enough structurally, and I think to I, I feel like to give Amy her due, um, I think Amy Slayton would be telling us or asking us whether whether it would still be engineering if we actually did address the structural inequities um, in engineering education. And I think those are those are real real questions <laughs> about how engineering has has uh, you know she argues that engineering is basically uh, constructed itself in ways that are synonymous with some of these isms. So yeah. I, I take that to heart and, um, and I still, uh, I push regardless because I think um, whether we end up in a space that can still be called engineering or not, we still have to do the pushing. So <laughs> yeah. 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 Donna, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. And thank you also for all the work you've done over the years. I think it's really important stuff. Well, thank you. And thank you for doing this podcast. I'm really excited about it as a project and the changes that it might inspire in others. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things like most things in this world depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are supported by the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Fort is the Athenaeum Coordinator and Digital Humanities Specialist at VT Libraries, and he serves as producer and sound engineer for the podcast. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs>